This video is brought to you by Dashlane. Never forget a password again. Greetings, motherfuckers, my name is Sam, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about the cheery subject of prisons. Yes, sadly, the time has come. My myriad of pun-based crimes against comedy and inhumane mispronunciations of foreign words has gotten me sent to internet prison. But please don't weep for me, my adoring fans. I'm quite looking forward to it, actually. I'm gonna get all tatted up and get in shape running away from all the people trying to shank me silly. Can't wait. But what are the benefits of building a circular prison? How can reading as many books as possible help you if you're sent to prison in Brazil? And what should my prison name be? I'm thinking something intimidating like Scary Sammy or Sam the Fact Man. <laughs> Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so pull on your orange jumpsuits, get comfy in your bunk, and prepare to shower with large groups of other people. I am Confucian. As we count through 101 facts about prisons. Number one. In case you were curious, a prison is a facility in which people, usually called inmates, are forcibly confined, separated from the rest of society, and denied a variety of freedoms under the authority of the state. Got it? Okay, good. Moving swiftly on. Why is this one Kansas? Number two. Prisons are primarily used within a criminal justice system, in order to house those charged with crimes who are awaiting trial, as well as those who have pled to or been found guilty of crimes, for which they are sentenced to a specified period of imprisonment. Just getting the basics out of the way, you know? Number three. Prisons are known by a variety of colourful terms, often used to avoid the negative connotations of prison. Such institutions may be referred to as a jail, correctional facility, penitentiary, detention centre, remand centre, or internment facility. Number four. Naturally, there's also a wide range of slang terms for prison, including, but not limited to, the slammer, the can, the clink, the joint, the calaboose, the hoosco, the pokey, the big house, or being banged up behind bars or up the river. A particularly British expression for being imprisoned is to be at Her Majesty's pleasure, which is a hilariously quaint way to refer to being locked in a room with an aggressive cockney who beat up a stranger in a pub for supporting the wrong football team. While we're on the subject of keeping things under lock and key, you might want to consider the services of Dash Lane who can help you protect your online passwords and personal info, and also happen to be the sponsors of this video. Dashlane allows you to encrypt all your data, financial or otherwise, with the use of a master password that is never sent to or stored on Dashlane's servers, meaning that even if Dashlane gets hacked, your information would still be completely safe. Dashlane's tools let you have complex and unique passwords for every account, and will automatically put them into login boxes when you access any website, saving you precious time for surfing the World Wide Web. It also comes equipped with a VPN, allowing you to keep your internet activity totally private and out of the hands of your ISP or hackers. They could even scan the dark web for your details and let you know if they're being used by shady characters. And best of all, Dashlane's basic plan is completely 100% free. You can download it right now using the link in the description below, and you can even get 10% off the premium plan at dashlane.com slash 101 facts. Number 5. During wartime, prisoners of war or other detainees may be held in military prisons or prisoner of war camps, while large groups of civilians might be imprisoned in internment camps. A famous and particularly egregious example of this is when the United States incarcerated up to 120,000 people of Japanese ancestry during the Second World War, most of whom were American citizens. Yeah, it's getting heavy this early. Strap in. Number 6. Outside of what many may consider to be necessary uses, prisons can also be used as a tool for political oppression by authoritarian regimes, who may imprison perceived opponents simply for criticising those in power, often without fair trial or legal due process. Hey, it's heavy I know, but this is the way the world is these days. This is generally considered to be pretty illegal in its own right under international law, governing fair administration of justice, so don't even think about it, kids. Number 7. Within criminal justice, there are a number of motivations behind the decision to send someone to prison. The first of these is rehabilitation, which seeks to change the lives of prisoners in such a way that they become more productive and law-abiding members of society upon their release. Imprisonment as a form of rehabilitation was promoted by prison reformers in the 19th century, who advocated prisons as a more humane alternative to the harsh punishments of the past. Number 8. Another consideration is that of deterrence. Not a man called Terence, but a concept which holds that sufficiently unpleasant penalties in the form of long prison sentences will prevent prisoners from reoffending upon release, as well as discourage potential criminals from, well, becoming criminals. Number 9. One of the more basic motivations behind the use of prisons is incapacitation. Put simply, those who perpetrate acts of violence or illegality who are held in prisons are unable to commit more crimes, thus keeping communities safer. See? Number 10. Lastly, there's the role of retribution in the imprisonment of criminals, which bears little consideration for the possible social benefits of prison and focuses instead on inflicting suffering and misery upon prisoners out of a sense of punitive morality. 
Number 11. <laughs> Given the extensive use of incarceration in today's world, you might be surprised to learn that up until the 19th century, imprisonment played a relatively minor role in the punishment regimes of most countries, as bloodier, less humane penalties were more often preferred. Early prisons were rarely built specifically for the purpose of imprisonment, and most cultures used makeshift cages or dungeons in already existing structures. Number 12. Bloody blah blah. Bloody bloody blah. As such, there are numerous famous structures around the world that have been used as prisons throughout history. For example, the Kremlin, Chateau d'If, or basically any British castle. And there's a lot of British castles, it's kind of our thing. Number 13. Regardless, imprisonment as a form of punishment has existed for thousands of years. The use of prisons can be traced back to the rise of social organization itself in the form of the state. But this one is not Arkansas. Along with the advent of the written language, which prompted the introduction of formal legal codes. Basically, as soon as humans form societies, they require prisons in some form because some humans are dicks. Number 14. Several thousand years ago, the ancient Babylonians utilized places of incarceration called Bitkili, where debtors and petty criminals were forced to work off their debt, and in other news, Bitkili sounds like a metalcore band from the mid noughties Number 15. The earliest known use of imprisonment as a form of punishment can be traced back to ancient Mesopotamia, described in the oldest known surviving law code, the Code of Urnamu, which itself dates back to 2100 or 2050 BCE. It's a great read, by the way, but to save you some time, it states that if a man commits kidnapping, he is to be imprisoned and pay 15 shekels of silver, which in those days was a lot of money. Number 16. Many ancient Greek philosophers such as Plato developed the idea using punishment to reform criminals rather than simply as a method of retribution. Initially, imprisonment functioned as a penalty for those who could not afford to pay fines. Since many impoverished Athenians could not pay, leading to indefinite periods of imprisonment, time limits were eventually set instead, which was, ha, huh, that's nice of them, I guess. Number 17. Classical Greece and Rome employed the sporadic use of private prisons called Casa Privatus to detain slaves, debtors, and those awaiting trial or execution. Casa Privatus sounds like the name of Bit Kitty's debut album, doesn't it? Number 18. The prison in ancient Athens was known as Desmaterion, which translates to Place of Chains. Literally, all these prisons sound like heavy metal bands. Number 19. Imprisonment with forced labor on public work projects was a common punishment in ancient Rome. In many cases, criminals were sentenced to slavery, often in something known as a gastula, which was a primitive form of prison in which offenders were chained to benches and forced to work. Number 20. One of the most notable Roman prisons was the Mamertine Prison, established roughly in 640 BCE by Ancus Marcius, the legendary fourth king of Rome. The Mamertine Prison was situated within a sewer system beneath the city of Rome, ugh, and contained a series of dungeons into which prisoners were lowered, and held in exactly the sort of conditions you would expect from a literal sewer dungeon. Number 21. Jails in the English-speaking world can be traced at least as far back as the year 1166 CE, where King Henry II required that each sheriff establish a county jail in his shire. Smart guy. Number 22, oh, 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 yeah. In the 16th and 17th centuries, a number of small prisons known as Bridewells were opened in England as part of a move to suppress vagrancy. Named after St. Bride's Well in the city of London, which was near such a building, these structures were designed to hold petty criminals who were made to work, usually spinning or weaving. Number 23. The introduction of cellular confinement was an important step in the development of the modern prison. It's generally believed that the first examples of cellular prisons were located in what is now Italy, in the form of 16th and 17th century institutions like the Hospice of San Filippo in Florence and the San Michele Hospice in Rome. Number 24. Throughout the 18th century, English philanthropist and prison reformer John Howard worked to improve the conditions in prisons after visiting one in Bedfordshire and finding the pretty dire environment much the same as in other institutions. Howard's work led to two parliamentary acts, one abolished jailers' fees, and the other made improvements to the prison system leading to better prisoner health. Number 25. In the 19th century, the good old U.S. of A took the lead in the creation of the modern prison America with the development of two opposing prison models. The first was known as the Auburn system, in which inmates were held in cells at night but allowed to work and socialize in communal areas during the day. The Auburn system became the most widely used system in the U.S., as it was cheaper to operate and allow for the use of congregate labor to make money. Number 26. The second model, known as the Pennsylvania system, became more common in Europe and South America, and kept inmates in separate cells for 24 hours a day throughout their entire sentences. Wow, that's rough. This system was favored by those who promoted the role of solitary confinement as a way to encourage prisoners to reflect on their past behavior, as well as a method of keeping prisons as safe as possible. Number 27. The Pennsylvania system was pioneered at Walnut Street Prison in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which operated between 1773 and 1838. The original prison system held little regard for the well-being or rehabilitation of prisoners, as large groups of inmates were housed in dirty and overcrowded rooms in which violence erupted frequently. Number 28. 
In 1790, however, the Quakers of Philadelphia introduced the concept of the penitentiary, in which prisoners could reflect on their crimes as a mean of reform and become penitent. Thus the penitentiary bit. This was achieved with the establishment of a separate facility at Walnut Street Prison. <laughs> Walnut Street just sounds like a place in Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory. In which prisoners were kept in individual cells with very little human contact and no work to distract them from their intended self-examination. Number 29. Walnut Street Prison system of separation was further refined at Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary, which exhibited a characteristic wagon wheel design. At the time of its completion, the building was the largest and most expensive public structure ever erected you better than that, come on. In the United States, and soon after became a model for more than 300 prisons worldwide. Number 30. In the late 18th century, the English philosopher and social theorist Jeremy Bentham designed a form of prison structure known as the Panopticon, which sounds like a Transformers villain. This is not a Transformers villain, even though it sounds like one, but it is an innovative design, which arranged cells in a circular or semicircular structure with a central tower from which the guards can observe every single cell. The prisoners, though, can't see whether or not they're being watched, which creates the assumption that they are potentially under observation at any given time, incentivizing, or rather, scaring them, really, into regulating their own behavior. Number 31. Though there were plans to build a Panopticon National Penitentiary in Britain, various problems and concerns eventually meant the project was abandoned, and Bentham never saw a Panopticon built during his lifetime. Poor Jeremy. Since his death, though, a number of prisons incorporated elements of the Panopticon into their design, the most fully realized of which is the Presidio Modelo complex in Cuba, which was completed in 1928 and closed in 1967, by which time it became infamous for overcrowding and riots. Oh dear, that was the opposite of what Bentham was going for, I think. Number 32. In 1870, more than 130 delegates convened for the National Prison Congress in Cincinnati, Ohio, to discuss and define standards for prison reform. The attendees, which included wardens, governors, prison chaplains, and judges, agreed upon a declaration of principles which placed emphasis on rehabilitation, education, and religion to improve the conditions within and effectiveness of prisons. Good job. Number 33. The 20th century also saw the rise of Russia's forced labor camp system, known in English as gulags. The use of these brutal prisons peaked during Joseph Stalin's rule between the 1930s and early 1950s, and are widely recognized today as a major instrument of political repression in the Soviet Union. By 1980, roughly 99% of all convicted criminals served their time in these labor camps. Number 34. Early 20th century Britain saw the rise of youth detention centers called Borstals, named after a prison in the village of Borstal near Rochester in Kent, where the first such facility was established. Now, these institutions claimed to reform the most antisocial youths with a focus on routine, discipline, and authority, but they did gain a fearsome reputation as hotbeds of violence and abuse. For this reason, Borstals were officially abolished in 1982. Number 35. In the 1980s and 90s, boot camps and military schools became a common approach for tackling juvenile delinquency, as tough love programs emphasizing education, exercise, and military discipline once again became fashionable. Many young offenders were and continue to be offered such institutions as an alternative to prison, though in some states they can be sentenced to participate in such programs. Number 36. It should be mentioned, though, that, as with Borstals that we mentioned earlier, research has shown that boot camps do not reduce recidivism, which is a fancy word for basically going back to do more crime, producing only short-term changes in attitude and behavior. The use of boot camps and military schools remains controversial, as, like many other harsh youth justice systems, they have a reputation for bullying and abuse. Number 37. Across the globe, more than 10 million people are currently in prison, which equates to little more than the entire population of Sweden. That's not to say that the entire population of Sweden are in prison, unless Sweden itself is one big prison like Pascal Savage did in Johnny English. Oh. Number 38. Worldwide, approximately 700,000 women and girls are in prison, meaning that about 93% of all imprisoned people are men. Yay, women. I mean, not in a pro-crime kind of way, but you know what I mean. Number 39. Apparently, though, it's not entirely our fault, fellas, that we get banged up so often, as apparently in criminology there is a known institutional bias against men in the criminal justice system, which has been confirmed in several studies, for example from the University of Michigan. Men routinely receive longer sentences than women, who are significantly more likely to avoid charges and convictions altogether. Even when they are convicted, women are incarcerated at roughly half the rate that men are. Number 40. By far the most prison happy nation on earth is. Get a drum roll, please. <laughs> Sounds like a drum roll, but it's the United States! With incarceration rates of roughly 1 in every 107 people, America imprisons its citizens at rates that exceed even countries suffering with war or authoritarian political regimes. Number 41. This translates to the staggering figure that approximately 2.3 million Americans are behind bars right now, which constitutes the largest prison population on earth. The meaning of life. As a result, even though the US is home to less than 5% of the global population, America's prison population accounts for roughly 25% of prisoners worldwide. Number 43. 
In case you were wondering, by the way, the current prison capital of the world is the US state of Oklahoma, with an incarceration rate of 1,709 prisoners per 100,000 people. That, that's a lot of people behind bars, guys. A lot. Number 44. Another depressing statistic for you now that states that since the 1980s, the US prison population has more than quadrupled. Quadrupled, I say. Number 45. You may be thinking, but Sam, why? Why does this happen? And well, the reasons why the United States has imprisoned so many people in recent years is multifaceted and frankly, extremely complicated. Two common explanations refer to increased sentence lengths and the so-called war on drugs. However, many experts are beginning to suggest that the main cause of America's unprecedented incarceration rate is simply a generally more punitive approach to criminal justice compared to previous decades, leading to longer sentences compared to the rest of the world and an increased tendency to charge people with felonies. Number 46. There are over 5,000 jails and prisons in the US. To get a scale of exactly what that means, there are more jails in the United States than there are colleges. Number 47. The average annual cost of imprisoning one inmate in a federal prison is somewhere around $30,000. I have it in good authority that that's enough to purchase quite a large number of processed chicken pieces. Number 48. Similarly, state spending on corrections has ballooned by about 300% in the past two decades. God, that fact is depressing, but at least I've got to use the word ballooned. Small victories, eh? Number 49. Depending on who you ask, the cost of incarceration to the American taxpayer varies pretty significantly between $70 billion and $182 billion annually. With that amount of money, just imagine how many chicken nugs we could all buy. Too bad it's all going on putting people in prison. Oh well. Number 50. Despite having by far the highest incarceration rate in the world, right now America's incarceration rate is actually at a two decade low. Oh, it's got a sting. Number 51. After the US, the countries with the most imprisoned people are China, Brazil, Russia, and India. In case you were wondering. Number 52. Collectively, England and Wales have the highest imprisonment rate in Western Europe, with roughly 149 people per 100,000 of the population behind bars. Well, at least we're the best at something. Number 53. Meanwhile, countries like the Netherlands are actually closing prisons due to a lack of prisoners. Alright guys, no need to show off, is there? Number 54. Today, most prisons are surrounded by walls, fencing, geographical features, and many other barriers to prevent chances from attempting to leave prison before they get their full dose of justice. Additional security measures often include concertina wire, electrified fencing, armed guard towers, security lighting, motion sensors, trained dogs, and roving patrols, depending on each facility's level of security. Number 55. In the 19th century, an English convict named Joseph Belitho Johns was transported to the British penal colony of Western Australia where he gained a reputation for escaping from prison on numerous occasions. Johns, who was commonly known as Moondyne Joe, was eventually placed in an escape-proof cell built specifically for him, using concrete and railroad sleepers. Of course, he escaped that too, and was free for two years before being recaptured. Number 57. If the idea of escaping from prison using a helicopter sounds far-fetched to you, you may be surprised to hear that helicopter prison escapes actually happen often enough to warrant an entire Wikipedia page devoted to the subject. Whirly bird jail breaks date back to the early 1970s and succeed surprisingly often, resulting in the liberation of drug lords, gangsters, and IRA members. Number 58. In case you were wondering, and I know you were, you little tyke, the country that's hosted more recorded helicopter escapes attempts than any other country is France, with at least 11. This is in part due to the exploits of rogues like Pascal Paye, who has managed to use helicopters to escape from prison on no less than three occasions. Number 59. In some countries, such as Mexico and Germany, the act of escaping from prison is not an illegal act, because their laws recognise that all people have a fundamental desire to be free. As such, escapees who are recaptured do not have any extra time added to their sentences for skedaddling. Sounds good, right? Number 60. Except that they almost certainly will have their sentences lengthened, because there are a few important terms and conditions that accompany these loopholes. In many of these nations, if a prisoner breaks any other laws in the course of their escape, such as damaging the prison itself, the individual is still culpable of those crimes. Even if a prisoner doesn't smash a window or break through a fence during their bid for freedom, escaping while wearing prison clothing constitutes theft. The obvious answer, therefore, is to escape while completely naked. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Number 61. In many of the numerous countries which retain the death penalty as a form of punishment, prisoners awaiting execution are often housed in a special section of the prison, generally known as death row. The term is also used in a figurative sense for condemned prisoners, even in prisons without a separate death row area. Number 62. It's customary for condemned inmates to receive a last meal, which, as you are probably already aware, is the final meal of the prisoner's choice before execution. In most American states, such as Texas for example, last meals are limited to a monetary value of no more than $20. However, in other states such as Florida and Indiana, last meals are limited to $40. 
while the sunny state of California IA indulges its death row inmates with last meals worth up to $50. Number 63. In the United States and Canada, prisoners who misbehave are sometimes served a meal known as Nutra Loaf, which usually consists of a blended concoction of leftovers baked into a solid loaf. Ugh. Nutra Loaf contains all the nutrients and vitamins necessary to constitute a healthy diet, but has a deliberately unappetizing taste, sometimes said to resemble that of cardboard. And I've eaten cardboard, it's not nice. Many argue that serving deliberately unpleasant food to prisoners is unethical, while others say that Nutra Loaf significantly reduces violence. Nintendo 64. Somewhat unsurprisingly, everyone's favourite religion, Scientology, has its very own prison, ominously nicknamed The Hole. Despite insistence by Scientology officials that The Hole doesn't exist, numerous people have given accounts of the facility, where high-ranking members deemed to have fallen short of expectations are held for months or even years. Number 65. Some prisons in Brazil offer inmates a chance to reduce their sentences by reading books and writing corresponding essays. Prisoners participating in the Redemption Through Reading program can have four days removed from their prison stays for every book they read, up to 48 days a year. Number 66. Another prison in southeastern Brazil gives inmates the chance to reduce their sentences by sitting on stationary bicycles hooked up to car batteries and pedaling like there's no tomorrow. Hmm, that sounds familiar to me, Charlie Brooker. The batteries are then used to power streetlights in a nearby town. Number 67. The longest sentence ever requested is thought to have been levelled against a man from the Spanish island of Mallorca in 1972. Gabriel March Granados was a postman in the island's capital city, Palma, who was accused of failing to deliver 42,768 letters, from which he pickpocketed any enclosed valuables. Oh, Gabriel. Prosecutors wanted to have him serve nine years per undelivered letter, which works out at a frankly hilarious 384,912 years in prison. Ultimately though, Granados was sentenced to the somewhat more reasonable strength of 14 years and two months. Number 68. The longest prison term that was actually handed down to someone is thought to have been given to Thailand's maid Chamoy Thipyuso, the wife of a high-ranking officer in the Thai Air Force. Over the course of two decades, Thipyuso operated a Ponzi scheme that scammed over 16,000 people out of a total of 8 million baht, which I assume is a lot. Thipyuso was ultimately sentenced to spend 141,078 years in prison, but for some reason was released after only eight. Her victims were never compensated. Number 69. Place of chains. In 1979, computer hacker Kevin Mitnick broke into the computer network of Digital Equipment Corporation and copied their software, a crime of which he was convicted almost a decade later in 1988. After a short stint in prison, Mitnick hacked into the Pacific Bell Telephone Company, for which he was dramatically pursued by police for years before being apprehended in 1995. Mitnick's skills as a hacker were so overblown that it was rumoured he could start a nuclear war by whistling into a telephone, and as such he spent much of his time in prison in solitary confinement. Number 70. At the Decatur Correctional Facility in Illinois, incarcerated women are allowed to keep their babies with them in prison for up to two years. These absolute mothers had an almost 0% recidivism rate, compared to the statewide average of over 50%. Number 71. In China, many wealthy people who commit crimes hire body doubles to stand trial and serve their prison sentences. The practice is so common it even has a name, Ding Zui, which roughly translates to substitute criminal. Number 72. Surprisingly, wow, my voice there, people aged 60 and over are the fastest growing age group in the American prison system. Between 2002 and 2015, the number of sentenced prisoners aged 60 and over rose by a staggering 164%. Number 73. A prison in the US state of Indiana allows murderers to adopt cats and keep them in cells. The program, which has been linked to better inmate behaviour, has been running for 20 years and is so popular that there's even a waiting list to adopt one of the 75 cats who call the prison their home. Number 74. Though controversial, it's been shown that providing inmates with access to television is a much cheaper way of keeping them quiet and subdued than it would be to hire more guards. Number 75. Since 1999, several companies in America outsource call centre duties to prisons. The prisoners, who may be drug dealers, prostitutes or murderers, can generate savings that will be waiting for them upon release. Programs like this have proved controversial, with many claiming that they take jobs away from law-abiding citizens. Number 76. During the 20th century, prison inmates throughout the aforementioned gulags of the Soviet Union maintained a tattoo culture which was used to indicate one's criminal career and ranking. The tattoos themselves have symbolic meanings. For instance, skulls represent murderers, while religious iconography of the Orthodox Church and somewhat bizarrely cats are used to indicate thieves. Number 75. Arguably the most infamous prison in history is Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, often known simply as Alcatraz or The Rock. 
It was located on the island of, who guessed it, Alcatraz, which sits in the San Francisco Bay, approximately two kilometers offshore from the city of San Francisco, California in the United States. What do you mean in Arkansas? Prior to the notorious prison, the island was also home to a lighthouse, a military fortification, and a military prison. It's since become a popular tourist destination which draws in roughly 1.5 million visitors a year, who can leave of their own accord. Number 78. Spanish explorers discovered the island in 1775, and named it <coughs> La Isla de los Alcatraces, which roughly translates to Island of the Pelicans or Island of the Gannets. This is due to the number of seabirds which lived there at the time before they were driven away by human activity. Number 79. Many of the actual buildings on the island were built in the decades before the prison opened in 1934, including a hospital and a mess hall. A new cell house measuring approximately 150 meters in length was completed in 1912 and was said to be the longest concrete building in the world at the time. Number 80. Alcatraz was used to house some of the nation's more dangerous criminals, who often caused trouble at other prisons. The average inmate had a sentence between 20 to 25 years, and would spend between 6 to 8 of those years at Alcatraz before they were considered reformed enough to be sent back to another prison. Number 81. The Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary was in operation for almost three decades before it was finally closed on the 21st of March, 1963. During this time, the infamous prison housed numerous high-profile criminals, including the likes of Machine Gun Kelly, Mickey Cohen, Whitey Bulger, Alvin Creepy Carpis, and the notorious gangster Al Capone, who was moved there as his mental health slowly declined from the effects of syphilis. Classy. Number 82. Another notable inmate at The Rock was Robert Stroud, aka the Birdman of Alcatraz. Stroud was a convicted murderer who had become an avid bird keeper and respected ornithologist while serving time at a previous prison, where he kept hundreds of canaries and contributed to the academic understanding of the species. His reputation, both as an ornithophile and psychopath, followed him to Alcatraz, where he was imprisoned for 17 years. Number 83. Alcatraz has also hosted over a dozen escape attempts, such as the violent prison break known today as the Battle for Alcatraz, in which six inmates attempted to free themselves by stealing weapons from a poorly protected gun gallery and taking a number of guards hostage. For several hours between the 2nd and 4th of May 1946, the belligerent prisoners exchanged gunfire with remaining guards, until the cell block was finally stormed by marines under a hail of grenades and rifle bangs. Number 84. Three of the six would-be escapees were killed at the Battle of Alcatraz, while another two were ultimately executed at St. Quentin State Prison. The final conspirator was sentenced to an additional 99 years in jail, though he was finally released 27 years later. Two guards were also killed during the attempted breakout, which constituted the bloodiest episode of the prison's history. Number 85. A few years later, on the 11th of June 1962, three inmates by the name of Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin managed to escape their island prison on Alcatraz. Over the course of six months, the intrepid trio had used improvised tools to chisel away at the salt-damaged concrete of their cells into an unguarded three-foot-wide utility corridor. The team used paint and cardboard to hide their progress and disguised the noise by playing the accordion. <laughs> wow, not kidding. Number 86. On the night of the escape, the three prisoners crawled through a hole in their cell wall, climbed up a network of piles to the prison roof, then descended a 15-metre wall by sliding down a kitchen vent pipe to the ground. From there, the trio inflated a raft made of more than 50 raincoats using a small concertina as a bellows. They then disappeared into the fog of the San Francisco Bay, never to be seen again. Number 87. The prison guards didn't realize the inmates were missing until the next morning, when they discovered the vacant beds contained nothing but bed sheets bunched up into the shape of a person and eerily realistic papier-mâché heads made of real hair and closed painted eyes. Ugh. Though the official determination was that the three men drowned, numerous sources have conceded that it's not impossible that the men survived. Number 88. Only a few months later, after the most famous Alcatraz escape, another inmate, John Paul Scott, again proved that escaping the infamous prison was at least theoretically possible. On the 16th of December 1962, John Paul Scott and Darl Parker squeezed through a window and swam into the San Francisco Bay. While Parker was caught in a rocky outcrop known as Little Alcatraz, Scott was found by a group at the foot of the Golden Gate Bridge, unconscious and suffering from hypothermia. Though his escape was ultimately unsuccessful, Scott is the only known person to have escaped Alcatraz alive. Number 89. In some kind of sarcastic mockery of the prison's former security staff, a triathlon entitled The Escape from Alcatraz Triathlon is held every year to prove that it's possible to swim from Alcatraz and live. In addition to the one and a half mile swim to San Francisco, the event also includes an 18 mile bike ride and an eight mile run. Number 90. Interestingly, Alcatraz was once the only federal penitentiary in the US that provided hot showers for its inmates. This was based on the belief that inmates who would use some nice warm water would not be able to withstand the freezing San Francisco Bay during an escape attempt. Also, it probably didn't help that these people had been locked in cages for years on end. Number 91. 
While Alcatraz developed a fearsome reputation in its time, it apparently wasn't quite the hellhole it's often made out to be. Many inmates, for example, appreciated the large ratio of guards and the one-man, one-cell policy, which made one less vulnerable to attack from disgruntled prison mates. Number 92. Not only that, James A. Johnston, the first warden of Alcatraz, knew that low-quality food would often cause the prison riots, so he made sure that the inmates were served good food, of which multiple helpings were allowed. Many prisoners considered the conditions inside Alcatraz to be relatively desirable, and several inmates actually requested to be transferred there. Number 93. Somewhat surprisingly, during its time as a prison, the guards and officers of Alcatraz lived on the island with their spouses and children. At any given time, roughly 300 civilians lived across three apartment buildings, one large duplex, and four large wooden houses for the senior officers. They had access to a small convenience store, a soda fountain shop, and their own bowling alley. There's even an alumni association for people who grew up on that island. Number 94. Another infamous American prison is the Maximum Security Correction Facility in New York State, thus disarmingly known as Sing Sing. The name of the prison is derived from the Sink Sink Band of Wappinger Native Americans who originally inhabited the area. Number 95. Sing Sing Cell Block A is the largest prison cell block in the world. The second largest is Sing Sing Cell Block B. It's a big prison, basically. Number 96. In the 1920s and 30s, the New York Yankees would play exhibition games against the Sing Sing prisoner team, who were known as the Black Sheep. Hello again, friend of a friend, I knew you well get that reference, you're a winner. Number 97. Sing Sing State Prison is located 30 miles north of New York City on the east bank of the Hudson River, which gave rise to the phrase, up the river, which is a popular American slang term for being sent to prison. I'll never do that again, I'm sorry. Number 98. Today, one of the most notorious prison facilities in the United States is San Quentin Prison in California. San Quentin actually predates and outlives nearby Alcatraz, having opened in 1852, making it the oldest prison in California. Prior to the 1940s, the prison housed inmates in substandard and violent conditions, which often included head shavings and irregular meals as punishment. Number 99. San Quentin currently holds the largest number of death row inmates in the USA, with 746 condemned killers residing in the facility. This is more than twice the number of death row prisoners in the second-ranked state of Florida, which is home to 347 people currently awaiting an end to their life. Number 100. Less depressingly, San Quentin Prison has one of the few inmate-run newspapers in the world, titled the San Quentin News, which even has its own website and Twitter account. Number 101. Not only that, San Quentin Prison was also home to the very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in a prison. Since then, hundreds of other AA groups have been set up behind prison walls. And that can only be a good thing. So that was 101 facts about prisons. Did you learn anything new? Have we missed any daring escapes out? Let us know in the comments down below. Also give this video a like and subscribe to 101 Fact if you haven't done so already. Go ahead, do it. 410,000 have. You wouldn't want to be left out, would you? Huh? Huh? The FOMO's seeping in. Whoa. Anyway, don't forget also to check out our sponsor Dashlane at dashlane.com forward slash 101 facts. It's in the description and there's probably a comment down there too, so no excuses. In the meantime though, my god, look at these two videos on screen. They're really going to wet your whistle. Go for it. Make my day. Click on one. And I'll see you there. Bye.